In the summer of 1969, Steve Grogan was 18 years old, Leslie Van Houten was 19, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Bobby Beausoleil were each 21, Charles Tex Watson was 23, Mary Bruner was 25, and Bruce Davis was 26. None of these young people committed acts of violence before that year. In fact, little of their lives before they met Manson indicated that they would someday be involved in murder. The infractions they'd had, texts with the typewriters, Bruce busted for possession, were minor. Sadie was the exception. She was on parole for robbery when she met Manson. Still, it took months, even years, to get them to the point where they could take a life. As Leslie explained, I think that the violence in us was somehow nurtured and brought out and brought forth. You know, it didn't happen overnight. He spent a lot of time taking middle-class girls and remolding them. Journalist Nikki Meredith wrote, Manson was an expert at selecting young people who were longing for an intense group connection, and he was skilled at reinforcing the bond that kept them together. In fact, it may be that the empathy they felt for each other, particularly for Charlie, made them so dangerous. It is precisely this longing for connection that makes many people susceptible to cults. This is why survivors can be so beneficial. By sharing their experiences, they help to warn the rest of us what the extreme of acceptance and connection can look like. By July 1969, Charles Manson was unstable, a man on the edge. He was seeing things that weren't there and hearing things not being said. He had the children move to a new camp by the waterfall with Leslie, Pat, and little Patty. The other women were told to scavenge for dry goods and preserve food to last for months or years. Those harsh Death Valley sands weren't going to yield fresh fruits and veggies after all. Charlie was chiefly focused on getting more money to fund his escape. He'd just received $5,000 from Linda Kasabian and three days later, $2,500 from Tex Watson. Where did that money go? Ed Saunders wrote, Vern Plumley has told of the large amounts of cash the family sometimes obtained. They had $30,000 and they went down and bought all kinds of sitars, guitars, drums. Everybody dropped some acid, got loaded. At the end of the acid trip, there wasn't an instrument that was playable. Charlie's other preoccupation that July was military-style training. These included field exercises like the proper way to kill somebody stab them, then yank the knife upward, apparently, and martial arts. The man conducting informal kung fu lessons was known as Karate Dave. Lynette recounted, Charlie was driving the three-wheeler around the valley one night with three of us girls in the back when, at a stoplight, we met Karate Dave on a rust-dusted Indian motorcycle, a nice old bike. Dave wasn't bad looking either. He was atypically clean-cut, blonde and masculine, and he came home with us after a few more stoplights. Charlie called him Karate Dave after learning he had a black belt. Barbara Hoyt had a crush on Dave, who was AWOL from the military. At Spawn Ranch, Karate Dave got bit by a rattlesnake and was glassy-eyed for hours, but recovered. Tex was also charged with leading military-style maneuvers, particularly for the women, Charlie intended to keep an eye on Watson after the debacle with Lots of Papa and ordered the Texan to get everyone prepared for Helter Skelter. That month, Mary stole a 69 VW right off a dealer lot. She drove it to the ranch where they stripped it for parts and abandoned the shell in the valley. Charlie also wanted more guns, knives, and bayonets. Mid-July, someone used a stolen credit card at a Los Angeles gun shop to buy several rifles. On July 15th, the VW stolen from Dick Joyce Volkswagen in Van Nuys was spotted at Spawn Ranch in an aerial flyover by LAPD officers Lee and Dreckenridge. They also spied two other VWs south of the main buildings, suspected auto theft, and called into the station. On July 18th, 
The body of 16-year-old Mark Waltz, birth name Mark Glenn April, was found in Santa Monica. He was beaten and shot to death on Mulholland Drive. His brother told police that Mark hung out with a bunch of hippies at Spawn Ranch. In fact, Waltz worked at the ranch that summer as a stable hand. Mark, who lived in Chatsworth, liked stealing parts from cars, often in Devil's Canyon. His brother Alan believed that Mark may have been stealing parts on behalf of the Manson family, specifically VW parts to be used in dune buggies. Mr. X, our confidential source who dealt LSD to Manson earlier that year, told this author that Charlie had a scheme in 1969, stealing tires throughout the valley and selling them. According to police reports, Mark hitchhiked to Santa Monica Pier on July 17th to go fishing. His fishing pole was found in the early morning hours the next day. He was discovered later that afternoon on Mulholland, dead. His face was battered. He had three gunshot wounds in the chest and tire treads on his shirt as though he had been run over. Alan Waltz believed that Manson killed his brother and called Charlie on the phone, screaming at him. He also went to the ranch shotgun in hand to confront Manson, but he wasn't there. So Alan drove to the police station and told them to investigate. Police ultimately concluded that the Manson family was not responsible for Mark's untimely demise. But it remains an unsolved crime 50 plus years later. On July 19th, Scramblehead Clem walked himself out of the mental hospital following the previous month's arrest. He was back at the ranch by midweek. On the evening of July 20th, even the Manson family was aware of the moon landing. This bright and shining moment in American history, this leap forward for humanity, seemed to presage for many people of their generation a new chapter of optimism and adventure. But at Spawn Ranch, they were approaching the end of their freedom. That day, Manson attacked Gypsy after she and Brenda rolled a barrel of food down a hill and the lid broke off. Charlie was kicking me and I rolled over into a ball, trying to protect my body. Cher remembered, I didn't know why he beat me. He instilled terror toward the end there in every single person around him. He had total control over them. Manson also destroyed some of the sound equipment that day, stolen from the NBC van. It took years for Catherine Scher to divest herself of Manson's control. Later, she explained his hold on her. I was like everyone else, enslaved to the point I couldn't put two sentences together. The thing you have to remember about Charlie is that he was a con. Kids don't know about cons. They don't know about people who've been in prison. People in prison live by their wits. Otherwise, they don't survive. Charlie came out of prison with that skill. He knew what you were thinking before you did.